good, good, the purity of their heart, their intentions, and how they bring that forth in each one of you. Wow, how lucky you are. How lucky you all are. Um, love you, Win. She said she'd be there. <laughs> and all I see you and all that you do, I mean, I have to say that um, Mark and Wynn are really close to my heart. And um, I feel very fortunate to be close to both of them and to all these years um, be able to teach with Mark. And um, it, we're, we make a good teaching team and it's so easy. And with Wynn too. So, yeah, I feel very lucky to have been with all of you. And I'll, I'll miss seeing you every year. Um, I never missed one year except for last year. I came every single summer for 30 years. And so did Steve. That's dedication because we really care for you and for Mark and Wynn and what they're putting together, they put together here. And I had to take last year off because I was really tired. <laughs> I needed some time to rest. So I took a one month retreat of myself for myself. And I had two great people here, Vance and Deb. Um, it wasn't hard. I just said, could you please come and take my place? And they, yes, they were. So anyway, I, I think you're so lucky and uh, may you continue and may the Dharma continue in your heart and you grow more and more, letting go of greed, hatred and delusion and developing their opposites, um, generosity, goodwill and uh, mindful awareness and wisdom. So that's my wish for all of you. So I'm so uh, glad that I don't have to give a Dharma talk tonight. <laughs> it's This is open for questions about your practice. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do that was because I like to hear from you. You know, I grow from hearing what you have to say and where you're coming from. And also to be able to answer um, or respond to your questions or what you're saying. Sometimes I don't even know where it comes from. It just, uh, my own teachers, you know, come out. And so uh, I, I like to learn from that too. So I'm going to open the, the floor for those of you who have any questions. And I think a mic to go around. Oh, it's right here. Yeah. So we'll use the mic so people on Zoom can hear us. And people on Zoom, if you'd like to ask a question, yeah. maybe we could go back and forth okay. in person on Zoom and, and, and see if there are questions on Zoom too. Um, and on Zoom, if you have a question, maybe raise your hand and I can call on you, uh, your digital hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. So who'd like to ask a question first? Or just say how it is for you. take advantage <laughs> yes this might be you look beautiful by that way it's the yellow and the flowers and the red it's like the flower of your practice is in is in the beauty of the way you appear anyway this sounds like a conceptual question but it really isn't it's a heart question i think but I'm wondering if you would put in your own words the understanding of the difference between a Hinayana practice and a Mahayana. Mm. And maybe you've had, you know, conversations with people in other schools. Mm -hmm. I do some Zen and I do some Vipassana and it's, it's an ongoing exploration of mm -hmm. the Bodhisattva or the Buddha. Right. Uh, the difference between, I like to use the word Theravada you know, and um, Mahayana, and uh, and even Vajrayana, you know, beyond that. I don't know if beyond is the right word, but um, 
there's there's mostly similarities <laughs> I, I would say they come from uh, both of them come from different cultures you know so when the buddhist teaching went into other cultures it took up what that culture where that culture was coming from where the indigenous people of that culture how what was the way that they opened their hearts you know what was the way that they could take in uh, the major teachings of the dharma which are the four noble truths the eightfold noble path those are similar you know um, and all of the beautiful qualities of mind the major ones are the uh, four brahma viharas loving kindness compassion sympathetic joy and um, also uh, equanimity so there's many many similarities in that uh, the differences in the culture uh, the main difference is the way that the culture took those teachings and brought them forth for those people in that particular culture so uh, we have to respect that you know just like when the dharma came to the west it came into a new culture here and so I, i'm gonna just put that one in there because when the dharma came to the west people were interested in meditation a lot you know and what's going on in the mind and how that works and so there was a lot of interest in meditation but really not so much interest in developing the paramis or the beautiful qualities of mind not much interest in um, the practice of dana was very very important like in all the cultures that came from from asia sri lanka but that didn't get transferred here first so i'm just throwing in something different now and um so we were mostly interested in understanding you know so uh meditation came first and now like in the past 40 years kind of like this culture is catching up with a very basic understanding of sila which is um being able to live harmlessly and to live in harmony by taking the precepts of non-harming those are the same you know in the in all the different uh, Hinayana Theravada Mahayana and uh, then the other one is uh, Sila living in a non-harming way Dana and also developing wisdom so the last uh, there's kind of like what we call three pillars of the Dharma sila and dana sila and bhavana bhavana means developing the mind so all of those cultures have the same thing and you dealt develop the mind in two ways you develop concentration and in different cultures there's concentration in different ways you know like in the zen culture very different that that um it's uh offered to bring your attention to uh, around here the body and the Theravada in like in Buddhist countries like Burma even Burma is a little different from Thailand and how we develop concentration so uh, developing bhavana is in two parts developing concentration and then developing wisdom and all of those cultures have the same development in wisdom for example wisdom is about karma understanding karma the all in all the cultures understanding the four noble truths understanding the eightfold noble path understanding the five aggregates understanding the uh, dependent origination so there's a lot more similarities than there are differences so i hope that that helps yes when I I just want to add to that when I listen to um, uh, Tibetan teachers because we have a Tibetan Lama in our um, on our island I just I hear the same things from a different languaging and um, and I have great honor for that but I didn't really learn meditation from there so that's okay you know I just take in use what I can and then I filter it through my own understanding So...
So if you don't have any question, maybe you've got the answers. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Tim. <clears throat> um, something my teacher pointed out about the development of the practice is he said something like when the mind gets settled and concentration increases, then it's like the ego won the lottery. <laughs> it's like the ego won the lottery? Yeah. Oh, oh. And uh, say more. <laughs> that is just because like when... I find, especially when I'm on retreat, and I gotta, I gotta like be careful about how I practice now because like the concentration gets so strong that um, it does feel like you know it's like being in a car, like any direction the car is pointing, like concentration is like putting your foot on the accelerator. So uh, I was wondering if you have experience with like how to how to balance out the practice with like I guess the wisdom and the concentration. Right, right. So the main difference between wisdom and concentration is very simple. When you develop concentration, you bring uh, awareness or mindfulness to kind of either one object or objects like, well, like when you do metta practice. In metta, there might be the object of the person, the phrase, or the sense of metta, the feeling of metta. So it's similarly, similar tied together. And when you bring attention to that kind of one thing or various things that have to do with one subject matter, the mind develops that kind of one pointedness towards that over and over and over again. So that brings about this very deep tranquility, calm, concentration and the mind feels very very powerful and so in the in that powerfulness that, that's what you might mean by the ego <laughs> yeah you you notice that it's possible to turn the mind to something that's really uh one pointed on one object and it feels like really blissful and blissed out and but that's not the aim of the practice. The aim of the practice is to take that concentration and then change it to the four foundations of mindfulness, the Satipatthana Sutta. And so what, what you do when you change it to the four foundations of mindfulness, which include the body and the feeling tones that come up in connection with the body or the mind, and also um, it the the uh, various mental states that come up with that, um, wholesome or unwholesome, you're turning that concentration to changing objects. So what's difference be what the difference is between concentration and vipassana meditation, which is when you take the mind and you turn it towards changing objects, is that th it's there that the mind develops wisdom not in concentration. Tranquility, calmness, that's wonderful. And, and you want to stay there because it's wonderful to be there. So I was mentioning to the group that I was um, teaching that a lot of times when people develop this deep concentration, it's hard for them to go to changing objects. They don't want to because it's wonderful to be there. But you don't learn anything from just that. You learn how powerful the mind could be. You learn how tranquil, how much which concentration is there. But it's not developing the wisdom. So what wisdom is, is understanding the three universal characteristics. Those are how impermanent everything is, the selfless nature of everything, and also the dukkha or the suffering nature of everything, the fact that um, there's nothing in this world that's going to bring complete and everlasting satisfaction. So when the mind takes that concentration and turns it towards changing objects, it starts to see bit by bit all of these experiences. And the mind starts developing in wisdom. So what, what happens then is you begin to live in alignment with how things are. 
instead of insisting that it should be just blissful all the time. So if you don't go there, then your mind doesn't become free. It just hangs on to what's pleasant. So concentration is good, but it's not going to give you liberation. Concentration leads to concentration. When you use that to go towards vipassana, which is on changing objects, that leads to liberation. So you really have to know the difference between that and know when to shift. So when, when you're in retreat, that's what we help you in. We help you to know how to concentrate the mind and then at a certain point to shift it towards the changing objects. So a little Dharmet about that. That's a good question. Yeah, a really basic question that has a, a lot of importance in the Dharma. That was very Okay. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Any how the questions from there? Do you see anything, Gabe? Okay. Oh, yeah. Great. Is this what is that another question? Oh, it's come up. Yes. Yes. Go ahead and please ask. I hope I can hear you. Hi. Uh, so I'm relatively new to the practice and the terminology used here. Um, you spoke of after developing wisdom, then we want to take that, or developing concentration, we want to take that to changing objects. Yes. What does that mean specifically in a practice? What does that mean specifically? Yeah. Changing, changing objects. Okay. So in, in, um, concentration practice there's usually just one object like it could be um the breath you know coming to the breath that's developing some concentration or sometimes there's object on the object is on metta or compassion you know we can uh develop concentration with the brahma viharas as well those um metta compassion sympathetic joy equanimity those are just a few examples but in Vipassana, what we use as changing objects is the four foundations of mindfulness. The first foundation is the body, and within the body, there's the breath. So I started with that today. And when we turn the attention like to the breath, for example, we start to see the changing nature of that breath every moment, how it's changing every moment. So we might Pay, be paying attention to the movement of um, the abdomen as it rises and falls or at the chest area. And what the mind is turned towards noticing is the changing nature of that. And uh, so what happens during that time, you might not even know it or kind of make a Dharma talk in your mind about it, but your mind is developing wisdom at that time. The wisdom is experientially understanding impermanence by seeing like a moment of breathing in, arise, those moments arise and change and pass away. And also in breathing out, you notice those moments of, that are arising, changing and passing away. So by staying with that with a, a great deal of patience, you start to understand that experientially, empirically. And so maybe the second, uh, in the second part of the Satipatthana, you have feeling tones. So uh, at the heels of say, like seeing a sensation in the body, on the heels of that, you might see a feeling tone of it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And this is very subtle. But when the mind is really quiet, it can know those moments. And even that moment of that feeling tone is always changing. So when the mind is very quiet, it becomes like a crystal clear still pool. And you can see every single ripple in that pool. So it, it comes to that kind of uh, seeing that degree of the changing nature in that subtlety. And so uh, also in the third foundation of mindfulness 
a lot of experiences, mental experiences can come up. And the first two have to do with first body and then the mind and then more of the mind. It starts seeing the hindrances, for example, like aversion will come up. And so if you can stay with aversion long enough, you'll see it's always changing. It's moving, changing, getting more um, whatever, hardness, softness, fiery, coolness, all those elemental experiences start to happen. Attachment, the same thing, or doubt, you know, all those mental states that come up and any of the variations of those. So when you're really quiet and you're in a longer retreat, you start to see the changing nature. And some of us will see the impermanence in it. Some of, uh, some of us will see it's just going on by itself and seeing the empty nature of it in terms of the selflessness. And some of us will see, wow, there's nothing to hang on to. Everything's always moving. And there's not going to be any satisfaction trying to hold on to anything. So we tend to then just let go. So those, those are the things that happen when you turn your attention to the changing nature of everything. So that will come naturally. You know, in the beginning, we try to keep the, the instructions very, very simple and clear. And then in time, you see the various experiences that come out of that. The, those wisdom producing experiences are not like Dharma talks in your mind. I'm repeating that again, because we think it's going to be a concept laid over that. Every single one of those experiences that happen moment to moment are um, dropping wisdom factors in your mind stream. And when that happens over and over and over again, we become, we start to live in alignment with that truth instead of fighting it we still you know can discern in life the right thing to do but we're living more in alignment with it rather than just having the what we call views about it in in the dharma it's called wrong views about it that really kind of tie us up in 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 our lives so a little um there's always a little dharmet <laughs> it's not just like one sentence yeah so Beautiful. thank you for that's an imp, that's a good question. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. Yes, absolutely perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Kamala. My Hi. name is Jay. Um, okay. I've listened to your talks for a long time, so I just want to thank you so much. It's brought a lot of benefit to my practice in life. Um, I have a question about right effort. So uh, for a number of years, I practiced with a lot of fire. And then at a certain point, I saw the striving in that. So then I tried to stop striving. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but now I'm realizing that that's just the opposite. Right? Yeah. And you can be too loose also. Too loose, but also, um, yeah. And just sort of still the, that egoic move of trying to sort of get better by doing it right sort right. of thing. Like. Exactly. I was, I'm trying too hard. Okay, now I'll try to try less as a way of sort of doing it better. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> That's the way we learn. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So yeah. there has been an enormous amount of learning. And um, yeah, I think was something I was listening to that said, you know, the only like that doesn't work. You know, that's an endless um, mm -hmm. rabbit hole. The only thing that works is wisdom awareness. Yeah. Um, and just that clear seeing of knowing what you're doing. So I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Yeah. One of the ways that we cannot be towards, you know, I'm not going to strive or that I'm not going to try to get anywhere is just be receptive. So one of the ways that we can use to develop a kind of receptive awareness is open the attention and notice hearing. Because you can't, you can't control hearing, you know, so if you notice hearing, hearing, and just let it, let that be a receptive experience, then when you transfer to noticing like anger in the mind, which is fiery, you know, then your experience is more natural. It just kind of receives it. 
and knows it in the moment. So then you'll see the, the middle path where you can just see how that happens naturally. It, it can arise, it can be received naturally, and it, be, it can be known with more clarity. Because if you're doing it the other ways that you were describing, it's kind of overlaying something on it or seeing through a, a kind of lens. And you're not really seeing what is actually happening. You're actually seeing through a lens and that distorts the experience. So um, like our teacher used to ask us, uh, he was kind of like, psychic you know the moment you would walk in he would kind of know just what's happening when you're walking in you know what's going on in your mind they watch that a lot not just what you're talking about but how you are how you're doing the practice and so he would say what color glasses are you wearing today yogi kamala yeah it's like what lens are you seeing through like you're wanting to get something or you're, you're not going to try, you know? <laughs> so those are the two things that you mentioned are the mind states to be receptive about, to see those particular mind states. Because if you're not noticing those, uh, we're blind to something. And sometimes we, sometimes what is most um, uh, there is not so noticeable. Yeah. So sometimes I would ask if I'm, I would ask, this is what I learned from what, one of my teachers along the way, Utejaniya. Um, I would ask, what else is here? Because I, I'm thinking I'm paying attention to the right thing, but maybe that's not the right thing. Maybe it's trying too hard, or maybe it's just uh, like hanging out because you don't want to, you know, some, a uh, yogi one time, just in this last retreat at home, one yogi was trying to not try. Yeah, as you're talking, trying to not try. And she said, I realized that I've been hanging out in La La Land by doing that. And I said, okay, do you know that moment of trying to not try? And she said, okay, I'll work on that. You know, so those are kind of things that we don't realize sometimes. Yeah, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> so there's more subtle things to see sometimes in your practice. Hi, Kama. Hi. It's so wonderful to have you here. I'm Jillian. Oh, Jillian, yeah. Name um, and face together. Oh, yeah. Um, so our community has supported the starting of a mindful parent group. Yeah. And it's so wonderful to hear you talk about your um, experience as a mom. And I'm a single mom. So yeah. it's even more poignant because these are voices that don't seem as common in the Dharma community. And, and um, it would be just so wonderful and such a gift to hear you comment on what you've learned um, as a mom, as a parent, um, mm -hmm. what you've, what insights you've gained um, on the Dharma because, because you're a parent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking that about, um, because a lot of us are not maybe par not parents maybe but we have situations in our life where we're caring for others yeah all of us do in one way or another um as you were speaking i something came up about what was it what was it that i learned the most and i have this um in our in the communities I teach in, sometimes you know I teach just equanimity sometimes, or sometimes in longer retreats I teach equi the equanimity practice. And one of the phrases I came up with in the equanimity practice, I use. I'm going to tell you this phrase, but I used it instead of the um, the traditional phrase. Okay, so the traditional phrase in equanimity is all beings are owners of their karma. 
their happiness or unhappiness depends upon their actions and not upon my wishes. When I heard that, when I first heard that, I thought, that's just the way it is there, you know, with, with my children. Now they're all grown, but, but how can I say that with, because when you use the word karma, it's like you, you really get, can get confused because um, like it says, I don't, I don't think there's words like this in the, in the ancient texts, but I've heard it said through my own teachers that if you think about karma too much, it will make your head explode because it's, you know, it's so complex. It's just so complex. The thing I turned that into with my children, when I saw the various things they were going through in their childhood years, and they're going through their teenage years and then getting to be adults and the confusion that comes all around how to be an adult and then getting lost in the things that they would get mixed up in, you know, during their, you know, goes on and on, is that I realized that I could, um, I could be really loud and insistent in telling each one of them, be careful when you go down that river, because I know at that one place in that river, there's a waterfall and you're going to get hurt. You know, this, I'm just speaking metaphorically. And they wouldn't listen. Of course, you know, they, they have their own path. So I learned, I learned to have this, um, this phrase, um, all beings have their own journey. And I can't control their journey. And that was like, when I, I do everything I can and tell, tell my growing children, please don't go down that river or please take your boat out of that river before you get to that waterfall. But they didn't listen. And so I, I would still tell them that, but when they fell over the waterfall or, um, <laughs> or they fell off the rocks and, you know, luckily they're still alive. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I do everything I can to lead them in the right direction, but in the end, they have their own journey. So when they just went this way and that way, or they started to go this way and that way, I would really um, say those that phrase to myself and to know I'm still going to tell you what's what can help you and what trouble you're going to get in. But what you do is is your own journey. And that has helped me not feel like a bad mom if they hurt themselves. Because I still did what I could do, but they, they really have their own journey. Karma is complex. Whatever they're going through, wherever it came from, from a past life or from that life. And like Manindra says, one of my teachers, you may not believe in past lives, but it's true. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you, you can't take that there's something that's coming in you know with this one being that's not just kind of you know there's patterns there are patterns that come in so um it's so complex so we do what we can and we we can follow our own way of you know each one has our own way of handling things but um in the end, uh, when when they go through something, you really have to let go that it's your fault. Because that's where we get in trouble, where we think it's our fault, we didn't do good enough and all of that. So that's helped me the most, that um, all beings have their own journey. Yeah. And I've taught people, the kids along the way, you know, this, this is what is beneficial for your life. And this is what's not beneficial. So all my children are not Buddhists. One of them is a self-proclaimed Buddhist. But um, the other one pays a lot of attention to karma. And two of them are very, very uh, beautiful Christians. And so I, I, I really... Um, I still talk to all of them about karma, but I really, um, 
I really feed their Christianity in the way that helps them. I, I've never, I taught them all meditation, but I don't require them to follow the path that I'm, yeah, and they like it that way, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How about it? Is there something on that side um, there? Just they can't see us. So. Anyone on Zoom want to speak? Oh, some can't see us. Oh, okay. We can't. They can't. They can only see you. They can't see. I see. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like. Oh, one person's Hey, who is it? Mira. Oh. Mira, you can go ahead. You're on. You're on uh, on the microphone. Hi, Kamala. Um, Hi, Mira. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, it's just so amazing. I um, I live in Mankato, about an hour and a half from Common Ground, yeah. and there's been storms all day. And I got about halfway to the city, and said, "This is not safe." And I was able to get home and get online. And I'm oh, good. I'm so appreciative, and um, uh, I I was looking at like the first year you came here was 1994 to Minnesota, and um, I wasn't there on that retreat, but um, I I just wanted to say hello and and thank you, um, and um. At, and it, it's so wonderful to kind of hear you speak because with each question that you're answering, it's like I'm I'm learning something a little different. Um, kind of like, well, I never quite understood that, and and then now that that That's makes good. more sense. And, yeah. Um, and so, like, I I really appreciate that. I'm I'm someone that's never been able to really use breath as an anchor. And um, and it's interesting to watch the flavor of my mind, <laughs> and um, and I um, I I've been um, I'm feeling like that there's some like intergenerational stuff that mm -hmm. is starting like starting to surface, and that some of the numbness uh, mm -hmm. is um, is starting to move. And, Good. and, and so much, I, um, I try to be open and I really love the way you were articulating, you know, about let it move. I have a very like quick mind that's always moving. And, mm. um, so that kind of practice has, has always, um, been very familiar to me, but I would never have named it a wisdom practice. So, um, oh. yeah, um, Yes. So it's all there, you know. It's and, all there. Mm -hmm. I yeah. wanted to tune into what you say. You have a mind that's always moving, right? Yes. Yeah. So just notice that because that is the understanding of impermanence uh, and wisdom dropping in the mind stream. Yeah, that's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. yeah, and, and you're, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and you're welcome. You look really bright to me. I I love seeing you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And I I was thinking, you know, well before, of course, you didn't have gray hair. <laughs> yeah, in the 1990s, and I just thought we all grew up together. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, it's been so lovely to be with you for all these years, all, all of you that I've been having connections with for so many years. Yeah. And I'd like to share a story because I've learned so much about Metta from you. And I know that there were times um, when we were meeting in Winona and, and I said to you once in a private meeting that... Um, when the Brahma Bihara practice, as much as I want to open to loving kindness and stuff, it was 
you know, it was feeling like closed in and, um, and you suggested, you don't have to sit here, go for a walk. And um, I have continued to so much love and appreciate the woods and being outside and what I can learn yeah. about changes. So thank you. That's for that. great. That's great. Good, Mira. Keep going. Yep. <laughs> Good. Okay. There was something over here. Hi, Kamala. It's you. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Um, I would like to get your thoughts uh, because Marilyn, uh, she just recently spoke about it. <clears throat> When you would offer in your teachings uh, the story about doing the walking meditation, mm -hmm. oh, I'm Diane, not that I want to manifest, yes. but, um, and uh, to know when it's appropriate to have a cup of tea and to, and, and even how in your guided meditation earlier mm -hmm. to refresh our intention. And so I'm working even in my own life and with other um, students on how to approach those that don't have resources to support them as they become uh, be, uh, begin their meditation practice. Mm -hmm. But it's applicable for all of us, or at least for in my own practice. Mm -hmm. Can you speak again how we can bring wisdom and wholesomeness in finding the balance of when we touch into trauma or that which is difficult in our wisdom practice. Mm -hmm. And we have the capacity of bringing in the Brahma Viharas for those of us who have been gifted to receive that teaching. Yeah. But for those who don't, and for those that um, are so vulnerable, how can we approach our own vulnerability and those that we are being present to, mm -hmm. to find that balance of to touch into it, bring wisdom to it, loving kindness. Anyway, that's, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear your thoughts okay. in Thank your you. wisdom. Thank you, Diane. Yes. Okay. yes. So uh, I want to expand upon wisdom a little bit more because in the Dharma, the wisdom factors are seeing um, impermanence, the not self characteristic and the dukkha characteristic. And that is on that deep uh, level, you know, of seeing what's going on moment to moment in the mind, mind, heart, mind, heart, same thing. But there's another wisdom that's just as important. And it's the wisdom that understands uh, what we are that understands that in our speech and our behavior, some of our speech and behavior will lead to harm and some of it will lead to harmony. Some of it will be beneficial for ourselves and others and some of it will be harmful or unbeneficial. So that part of wisdom is very, very important that we know that uh, wisdom on the relative level so if you're going against like the five precepts of not harming with our speech and behavior, and you're doing that kind of practice and renunciation, then that is beneficial, then that is uh, the kind of right view that one can have. So it, by bringing it back to the precepts, it it's, can be very, very helpful. Just starting out with the non-harming, but you know this, Diane, and all of you who are in the Dharma, it's not about commandments. Remember that in the precepts, it's more like, um, we'll do our best, you know, to incline the mind towards what's beneficial, towards non-harming. And in the precepts, it says it very specifically in a way that has to do with renunciation. So it's like saying, I will do my best to refrain from uh, killing anything, from causing any kind of harm, or killing anything. I will do my best uh, to refrain from taking what has not been offered. And, you know, the third one has to do with um, 
uh, doing your best to refrain from causing harm in any kind of sexual activity. It, it doesn't say don't do sexual activity. It's just about doing harm there. And the fourth one is refraining from um, not telling the truth, refraining from lying. So I just want to pause for a moment and say that's very important in the Dharma because as one of our major teachers, um, elder teachers who passed away already, told some of us that were, um, this was in the very first long retreat that I was in, um, we people were reporting things like, oh, I'm doing fine. You know, I can be with the breath and it doesn't go away from the breath. And I remember being in this group and I thought, I'm not in the right group because I, I can't be with the breath over and over again. It's getting lost. And, and that night, Upandita, who was a teacher then, he, he made a talk just about truth-telling. Yeah. <laughs> and the main thing that he said that I will always remember is, how can you experience the truth if you don't speak the truth? So I, at that moment, I just started looking at exactly what I'm saying, you know, like little things like, um, for example, saying um, people would say, oh, you had a retreat and how many people came instead of saying maybe there were various people there, a few people. And I would say, yeah, a lot of people came. But then I would think, not a lot, you know, <laughs> wasn't a lot. <laughs> and then I would say, yeah, there, there were like um, a few people that came to that sitting. So just even being very careful of how I'm describing something and even describing myself, like when we say, I'm, I'm not doing so good. Wow, that, that might be Musawada, you know, that might be saying a lie. <laughs> what if you are doing okay, you know, but you keep saying you're not doing well? In, you know, really be careful about those things, about even how you describe yourself. Um, be, just find a way to be really truthful without, um, you know, exaggerating or under speaking. So that has to do with that fourth precept. And the third, the fifth precept has to do with um, refraining from ingesting anything that makes the mind unclear. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to stop taking medicines, of course, but just watch it as you go through life. You know, it could be even you take, you have too much coffee or may, uh, whatever else, you know, it, it's, it, it's really not taking um, the kind of drugs that really make your mind, um, you know, you know, in, in the, I'm not, a, I'm not against this because I know that some of this is helpful. Some of these plant medicines are helpful these days. And um, so in, in Hawaii, you know, the, the word for um, uh, marijuana is pakalolo. Pakalolo makes, means makes you crazy. <laughs> I know that isn't true for... You know, they we use it now for other things, for medicinal things prescribed by doctors. So anyway, to be very careful about the the five um, about the five precepts that we take and those we take in renunciation that we will refrain from. And so then what we can do is practice, you know, the beautiful, the paramis and the four Brahma Viharas. That's what we can do on the opposite side of that. So even you don't even have to talk about that this is Dharma, you know, just talk. What about being loving to ourselves, you know, when we're going through um, the trauma experiences? And so when we can, I mean, I... I really leave it to trauma experts to do that, actually, because I'm not a I'm not a psychologist, and so I really refer people to go to, and prefer that people go to experts who know how to do that. But when they're in meditation, I'm very careful that they're not going right to the center of anything. That maybe whatever they're feeling, they they stay on the outskirts of it more, and we do something like titrating. So they touch it and then move away to something that's more pleasant, like hearing back to this and hearing. So just 
and then bringing metta to oneself to that moment to those tender moments so um just being really careful around that there people will go through trauma when they're going deeply so it's really helpful to to get them to do metta more to walk more to be in nature more um to watch um the trees moving and to take off their shoes and walk barefooted Th these are the things that i do i make people lay down on the ground you know, in hawaii you can do that because we don't have any ticks deer ticks <laughs> so yeah so things like that you know it's a long uh, these are very good questions because they're very down to earth yeah thank you diane so one more um, question coming to the close close now there, wasn't there something else in that line back there something there yeah. okay <laughs> oh you okay good primarily wondering is the cessation of suffering primarily associated with the absence of contraction like the mental, absence of contraction yeah like mental yeah. mental yeah i would say you could call all of the um hindrances or defilements a contracted moment yeah so there there is a cessation of greed hatred and delusion in in those i mean it it lead, all of that leads up to nibbana which is a, a lot of them times we talk about nibbana as a cessation to it's a cessation of everything in in one in a few moments but along the way there's cessation of the defilements and you would you would notice that uh when you're practicing sometimes you notice wow there is no hindrances in this moment you know or there's apparently no sometimes there's a deep roots of them but we don't really feel them so uh um deeply or they're they're not so loud and you'll start to see wow it's quiet there's the attachment aversion and delusion isn't here the mind is pretty clear those are cessation of those kinds of things um and so it really gets to the point where the mind uh starts having stops having reactivity to what's going on and the reactivity has to do with greed hatred or delusion so it gets to this place of what we call sankara upeka well sankara means all the things that come up and upeka means uh, equanimity so when the mind is so equanimous and it's not feeling any of the defilements or hindrances coming in it's very very clear it's uh, the equanimity in in vipassana is said to be the doorway to the unconditioned or the doorway to nibbana and that unconditioned is like um it opens the mind to that space beyond all conditions and you can't even imagine what that might be because we live in this conditional nature all the time so you you don't have to think about it it's just bit by bit that's how it unfolds and it just naturally will go there if you follow the instructions so just to end with um people would ask me what did you do you know in your practice what helped you the most and what helped me the most was i followed instructions <laughs> yeah cuz yeah cuz we think oh i'm going to do this or i'm going to do that oh that was more helpful you know i i'm just going to walk outside and be with nature and and that's helpful too but if you've got these incredible instructions that have been handed down for 2600 years and then you you think well you're going to do the way you want it to do well go ahead you know well that 
if if you're not following instructions, you're not going to get to the that kind of end to suffering. It might be very temporary, but um, what the Buddha was pointing to is the total end of suffering, when there's no there's not greed, hatred, or delusion. So what is there? There's just a sense of generosity and letting go. You're still participating in life. There's a sense of loving kindness, unconditional caring. You're still participating in life. You can still think, you know, and plan. It doesn't mean you turn into like somebody with a halo on your head and you walk around on air. And you're not deluded. You know what needs to be done and you do it. You know what doesn't need to be done and you don't do that. And it's just as simple as that. And so then uh, when, you're, when you're in that place, in no time, the mind just goes to that place where it's just completely clear, free from all suffering. And when the mind realizes that space, uh, it can never forget that. It will the mind will just go in that direction over and over again. And it takes, takes time for that to happen. And it's possible. It's possible for that to happen in that place. Okay. So a lot of words. <laughs> How about if we just sit for just a minute and let the words just settle down? you all. Thank you for your practice. Thank you, Kamala Masters, Hawaii. <laughs> um, that was beautiful. Thank you for your teaching. As everyone probably knows, all programs at Common Grounds are offered free of charge in the spirit of generosity. It's a spiritual practice invites us to explore the effects of mindful giving and receiving, seeing greed, fear, and confusion, as well as basic goodness of a generous act. Mm -hmm. We can be inspired by this great history of giving from the examples of the Buddha on down to the people in our community who have contributed their practice, efforts, and resources over the years. We have a guest teacher tonight, and two-thirds of what's played all towards Common Grounds, uh, the Common Ground Fund. Anyone who wants to use a credit card, I'll help you get her out in the lobby. Otherwise, you can use, there's also a Venmo QR code or cash or check in the bowl. So if you have any questions, you can talk to me. My name's Tim. Thank you, Common Ground, everybody that's here and that's helping. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>